hello there, everyone. Welcome, those of you joining us online or whether you're in person at Latham Half Moon Saratoga. We're really stoked that you're here. Hey, let me begin by asking you what I think is a fairly provocative question. Does religion work? You ever thought about that? You know, years ago, I made it my business to kind of, because I was curious, I wanted to know, I wanted to know firsthand and not just take it from someone else. I made it my business to study the major world religions. And for a number of years in my life, I really explored in somewhat, some depth what each religion is supposed to do. And I found myself asking, does religion work? And I would suggest to you that there are two acid tests, if you're wondering that same thing, uh, that any religion can sort of be evaluated by. Whether you're talking about a major world religion or what's most popular today, the DIY, the do-it-yourself religion, which many people are into, where they're kind of just making up their own religion as they go. Here's, I believe, those two acid tests. Does it get you close to God? And does it get you clean before God? I I don't know if it's right, but in my observation, it seems to me that that's what the major world religions are trying to do, those two things. Get their followers close to God, however they define God, and trust me, it's very different. Whoever he, she, it, or they may be, they're trying to get their followers close to God and then clean, meaning change their life in some meaningful way. And if you'll study the religions, you know that they try to do this in all kinds of different ways. It may be through meditation that brings illumination and a higher realization of what life really is, a higher consciousness. Some may do it through extreme ascetic practices where you cloister yourself away for a period of time. Others may do it through some program of life change where you apply yourself to certain principles over time. Others do it through pilgrimages or sweat lodges or whatever it might be. You're trying to get close to God and clean before God. So trust me, if any religion is going to be worth its salt. In my opinion, it needs to get you close and clean. Or can I give you two other words? It needs to give you accessibility and acceptability. Accessibility to God and acceptability before God. Close and clean. Now, here's my personal question for you. Does your faith do that for you? Some of you are on a journey where you're trying to figure out Is Christianity valid? Does it make sense? Does it, quote unquote, work? Well, the writer of the book of Hebrews, I believe, was trying to ask that very question of the old covenant. And so we're going to look today in Hebrews chapter 9, and we're going to look at the first seven verses. And I think you'll be amazed at how he answers this question with brilliant insight. So let's look at the first seven verses and then spend a few minutes unpacking them together. Now, even the first covenant had regulations of divine worship and the earthly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one, in which were the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread. This is called the holy place. And behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle, which is called the holy of holies, having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding the manna and Aaron's rod which budded and the tables of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. But of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Now when these things have been thus prepared, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle performing the divine worship, but into the second only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, 
which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. It seems to me that those seven verses are a distillation of what Old Covenant Judaism was about in its attempt to get close to God and to get the people clean before God. Now, if you were with us last week, you know we talked about covenants. And I appreciate all the positive input that you are giving. You're giving a lot of positive statements about how much you're learning. And I think church ought to be a place where we learn some things, where we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and of his word. And you could sort of summarize that Mosaic covenant that we talked about last week in these verses from Exodus 19. God said, now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And he says to Moses, these are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. That's the Mosaic covenant. And in chapters 20 to 24 of Exodus, he sort of defines what that relationship would look like. Ah, but in chapter 25, he turns a corner, an important corner. Not just what is this relationship going to be, but he begins to define where worship is going to take place. As they made their way to the promised land, they were to get close to God and clean before God in a place called the tabernacle. Can you believe it? It was a portable worship center. I think this is brilliant. The whole thing was going to be mobile. It moved with them as they moved around. And the guys who carried all the gear, all the pieces of equipment, I think of them as like the original roadies. I mean, Jackson Brown should have written the song for them, the loadout, stay. People stay just a little bit longer because, listen, they set it up and tore it down over and over again. And as they were on their way to another place, as the cloud of God moved and the pillar of fire moved, they moved to a different place and they set it up all over again and then they would tear it down all over again and they had to move it in precisely the same way. That's why I think of them as sort of the original roadies. Now, when they finally arrived at the promised land, the land of Canaan, they set that tent up once more at a place called Shiloh, And pretty soon, over a period of time, the tent itself wore out, and so they built a more permanent structure at Shiloh. You can read about that in some of the biblical passages. And then later, Solomon took this same grid, this same way of getting close to God, and he put that structure and that basic paradigm in the temple in Jerusalem. Now remember, all of this was meant to be a shadow of the realities that were going to come. All of this tabernacle stuff, all of this way of approaching God was meant to be a type. I hope you're remembering that word, type, an Old Testament person, place, thing, or event that foreshadows or prefigures a New Testament person, place, thing, or event. The Old Testament thing or event or person or is called the type, the New Testament that it represents is called the anti-type. So all these things were a type of Jesus Christ. They all pointed to Christ. And it was designed to get the people close to God and clean before God. Now, with that as a setup, I want us to do something right now together. I want us to watch a summary of, of what this tabernacle was like. I thought about all kinds of ways this week to do this. I I just didn't want you to glaze over on me as I described each part of the tabernacle and everything. So I thought, look, I found a seven-minute video. It's taught by Kay Warren, the co-founder of Saddleback Church. 
in Southern California. And I want to tell you right up front, the video quality is not high definition, okay? So the visual graphics and quality are a bit poor, but here's the deal. I'm asking you to bear with that, if you will, and just have patience and tolerance for that because the content, ooh, the content of this teaching is spectacular. So let's spend these minutes just watching that together, and then I'm going to come right back with an abbreviated sort of summary of what all of this means and what God is saying to us through Hebrews 9. So let's watch the video together. Hi, I'm Kay Warren. I'd like to walk you through my favorite portion of scripture found in Exodus, the tabernacle in the wilderness. After 400 years of slavery in Egypt, God led the Israelites to freedom. Shortly after, God invited Moses to spend time with him on Mount Sinai. On the mountain, God gave Moses two systems for his people. First, he gave a system of law. God gave detailed instructions for moral, ceremonial, and spiritual laws, the most well-known being the Ten Commandments. God knew the Israelites would break his laws, so at the same time, he gave a system of sacrifice that would allow the sins of the people to be covered and make it possible for them to be in a relationship with him. God's next instruction to Moses was to house the system of law and the system of sacrifice in a sacred, set-apart place called a tabernacle where God promised to live among his people. The tabernacle was built right in the heart of the Israelite camp at the base of Mount Sinai. While the pagan nations around them had gods of wood, stone, and clay, Israel had a personal God who wanted to be a part of their daily lives. The first thing you would see as you approached the tabernacle was a sparkling white linen fence. The fence was high enough that no one could climb over it and firm enough at the bottom that no one could crawl under it. The only way into the tabernacle was through a brightly embroidered gate. The white fence said, stay away. But the gate said, come in, but come in this way. Jesus is like the fence, pure, holy, spotless, and he is the gate. He provides us the only way into a relationship with God. The tabernacle is divided into three parts, the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. In the outer court, there were two articles used in worship, a large bronze altar where animal sacrifices were offered, and a large bronze basin called a laver, where the priests washed their hands and feet before offering the sacrifices to God. At the bronze altar, an Israelite would bring a spotless animal to be sacrificed, but before it was killed, he would put his hands on the head of the animal and confess his sin. There were many prescribed rituals in how the animals were slaughtered and what was done with them afterwards, but the most important part was that an innocent animal gave its life for the sin of a person. Jesus gave his life for us on the cross. He was an innocent lamb who voluntarily gave up his life to make us right with the Holy God. The next thing you would see is the bronze laver. Only the priests used the laver, and it was made from the mirrors of the women of Israel. There was nothing special about the water, but it served a practical purpose to clean their hands and feet. It also signified that they were sanctified, set apart for God's use. The labor illustrates to us how the Word of God cleanses us to be set apart for His service. The next thing you would see is the tabernacle building, which contained the holy place and the holy of holies. Only the priests were allowed in the holy place, and only the high priest was allowed in the holy of holies. As you entered the holy place, there was a very large, beautiful golden lampstand that was beaten out of one piece of gold. It provided the only light in the holy place. Jesus said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. He provides the illumination to our minds so that we can get to know God. On the right, there was a small wooden table covered with gold. It held 12 loaves of bread that the priests ate on the Sabbath. The 12 loaves represented the 12 tribes of Israel who were different in number and strength, but on this table, they were equal before God. Jesus said in John 6, 48, I am the bread of life. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Jesus is the bread that sustains us. The golden altar of incense was a small altar that was used just for burning incense. The sweet smell filled the holy place with a fragrance that pleased God. When the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, he would carry a burning coal of incense in with him. 
the altar is representative of prayer, and our prayers are to be offered to God at all times through Jesus Christ. The sweet smell of His fragrance is to permeate our lives. There was a thick embroidered veil that separated the holy place from the Holy of Holies. Once a year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest was allowed to go behind this veil and into God's presence. At the moment Jesus died on the cross, the veil in the temple in Jerusalem was torn from the top to the bottom by God's hand, indicating there was no longer any barrier between God and man. In the Holy of Holies, there were two pieces of furniture, the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat. The Ark of the Covenant was a wooden box covered with gold that held the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments a pot of manna, and Aaron's rod that budded. The ark was a place of safety in scripture, and this ark contained Israel's most valuable treasures. The mercy seat was a golden lid with two cherubim that fit on the top of the ark. The cherubim were symbols of God's judgment. The lid came between a holy God and the broken law contained in the ark. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest would sprinkle blood from a sacrificial lamb on the mercy seat, and then God's presence would fill the Holy of Holies, indicating that all of the nation's sins would be covered for one more year. The Bible calls Jesus Christ our mercy seat. The Bible says because of His death on the cross, His blood was the once-for-all sacrifice that finally made salvation possible. God has mercy on us because of Jesus. No longer are our sins covered for a year at a time, but finally forgiven. There is no need for further sacrifices. The temporary purpose of the tabernacle was to establish God as the true God, unlike the gods of the pagan cultures around the Israelites. And the eternal purpose of the tabernacle was to point to Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of God's plan of salvation, not just a temporary sacrifice, but the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now every person who puts their faith in Jesus Christ is reconciled to God. We become tabernacles, dwelling places for God with all access to Him forever. And so there you have it, a summary of this whole tabernacle system. Now, the only part of all that that Kay Warren just described that most people know anything about or care anything about these days is the Ark of the Covenant, sometimes called the Ark of the Testimony. I was teaching on the Ark of the Covenant once, and uh, one person in the class was just getting more and more confused, and finally he said, now, wasn't it supposed to float and hold animals? And uh, <laughs> I, I said, no, that's Noah's Ark. This has nothing to do with Noah's Ark, all right? But people are intrigued by the Ark of the Covenant. There are all kinds of conspiracy theories about where it is today. Is it still around? Does it still exist? One of the theories is that the Ethiopian Orthodox Church has it cloistered away somewhere, and they make a strong claim that they do. Another theory is that the Knights Templar in the Middle Ages uh, sealed it away in Chartres Cathedral about 80 kilometers southwest of Paris. One of the more popular current theories, as depicted in the popular TV show, The Curse of Oak Island, is that the Ark of the Covenant is actually buried on Oak Island off the coast of Nova Scotia down deep in the so-called money pit, and that with further drilling, they may find it. Nobody really knows where it is. In his blockbuster movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Steven Spielberg uh, described and depicted the Ark as having these magical properties, these powers that would give power and victory in battle to whoever possessed it. And so in the movie, they're trying to keep it out of the hands of the Nazis so that they won't have that power. Well, one thing is for sure. In the book of Hebrews, it is described as the most important piece of furniture in the whole tabernacle. Now, why was it the most important place? Remember I said, 
The acid test of any religion is does it get you close and does it get you clean? And God had said to them through Moses, this is where you're going to get close. This is where you're going to get clean. This is where it's going to happen. Exodus 25, verse 22, there above the cover between the two cherubim that are over the Ark of the Covenant, I will meet with you and give you all my commands for the Israelites. God said, and he affirmed that many times, by the way, this is the place I'm going to commune with you. This is the place I'm going to speak to you and reveal things to you. This is where the mercy seat is, where I will meet with you in mercy and grace because of your sins. This is where you get close. This is where you get clean. The Ark of the Covenant is where that's going to happen. But here's the problem. Only the high priest had access to that, and that only once a year. And so when he went into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, that one time a year, he went in with great fear and trepidation. In fact, this is not in the Bible, but we hear from other sources that they were so concerned even about the high priest going in there that when he would go in, they would tie a rope around one leg so that if the priest, the high priest were to be struck dead while he was in there, Nobody could go in and get him out, or they would die too, so they would pull him out with the rope. We have no evidence of that ever happening, but we're told that that's what they did. So as you can see, the access to God was quite limited. I lived for a period of time in Tallahassee, Florida, and if any of you have ever lived in Florida or or, or up on Florida football, you know that football, college football, is religion in Florida. And I went to a number of Florida State games. But the big in-state rivalry, baby, you know the one, Florida State, Florida. I mean, that is the one where people go nuts. And when I was there, I don't know if it's still happening. I would assume it is because it still happens in other places around the nation. Some counterfeiter, some joker would always, every season this happened, print some bogus fake tickets to the Florida State Florida game because they were in such high demand. People wanted to get close. They wanted to get in that stadium. They wanted to see the real action where it was happening. And so tickets were at such a premium, this guy would print these bogus tickets, sell them to unsuspecting, naive people who thought they had a real ticket, real access. They would show up at the gates at the stadium only to be turned away. The ticket didn't get them where the real action was. They couldn't get close with the tickets. To press this illustration a bit further, it would be as though every ticket, to the Florida-Florida State game was a bogus ticket except one, and only the high priest gets the ticket that is real. He's the only one who can get where the real action is, and that only once a year. And so the writer here is trying to make the point the old system wasn't adequate. This tabernacle that Kay Warren just told us about and that chapter 9 talks all about, it was just a picture, just a type of something greater that was to come because the old system had failed to give the people the closeness and the access that they needed. Now, please listen, listen for just a moment. I want to get very personal with you. If you're on a journey, as so many millions of people are in our world, And right here in our area, if you're wondering, hey, I don't want to be naive. I don't want to be gullible. I want to know where the truth is. I want to know what the religions of the world say. Can I tell you what I've concluded? You can dismiss it. You can believe it. You can say it's crazy. I've concluded that the religious systems of the world are inadequate to get you close and get you clean. 
In fact, many of you have come out of some religious system where it was kind of like this. There was this hierarchy of persons who had the authority and they could get close themselves, but you felt like you were always on the outer court, so to speak. And no matter what you did, you couldn't get real access, no matter how hard you tried to get there. And perhaps, perhaps all of your life, there's been this nagging sense that if God is really there, boy, I'd like to get close, but I can't get close. And I would say to you that religion is just that way. Religion is humanity's attempts to get close and get clean before God, but it only leaves you restless and empty. And according to Hebrews 9, it didn't get the Israelites clean. I mean, verse 9 says, accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience. Do you see that phrase? It cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience. So the old system didn't really cleanse their conscience. They never went away on the Day of Atonement thinking, oh, now I'm finally forgiven, because they weren't. Their sins were just covered for another year, but not really removed or forgiven and fully cleansed. And man-made sacrifices only give you temporary relief. Religion is an attempt to get close to God by getting clean through our own efforts, but we walk away with only temporary relief. And that's the point of this passage. The old covenant just wasn't adequate. It didn't work. But praise God, the new one does. Jesus, our high priest, has made a way for us to be close and to be clean. You say, but Pastor Rex, how did he do that? Well, let me explain it. The high priest of the old system brought the blood of bulls and goats, but Jesus brought his own blood. The high priest entered through the most holy place once a year, but Jesus (coughs) entered once for all. And the high priest obtained only temporary redemption. Jesus obtained eternal redemption. So here's the bottom line today. For anyone who has ears to hear, I want you to know that the whole claim of Christianity is that it does get us close through Christ into the very presence of God, and it gets us clean through his death. It gives us not just temporary covering for sin or temporary relief. It gives us eternal redemption. And my question for you is simply this. Have you experienced that? Do you know that you're close to God and clean before God? Years ago, as a young preacher, I heard this story, which I think is classic. It's about a little boy who wanted to make a boat. And even though he's just a young lad, he was pretty artistic. And so he carefully carved out of a piece of wood this really magnificent little boat, and he painted it some bright colors. And he put these little sails on it so it could actually catch a little bit of the wind and make it go across the water. It was a magnificent little creation of his own hands, and he loved it with his whole heart. And so he'd take it out in front of his house and sail it in the puddles there out in the street. It meant so much to him because he had made it himself. But one day he got bored with the puddles in front of his house, and he went down to a stream a couple of blocks away. It was a fast-moving stream, and so he would put his little boat in the water, and then he would run down and then grab it out of the water. And he would put it back in and let it go for a few feet, and then he would run and pick it up out of the water again. But the next time he put it in the water and he went to pick it up, he slipped and fell. The boat got away from him. It went faster and faster down the stream. He couldn't catch it, and he watched there with anguish, indeed horror, as his little boat sailed out of sight, gone forever. (laughs) This little guy was heartbroken. He had poured his creative energies into it, and now it was gone 
he cried and cried and cried. About a year later, he was with his parents in a neighboring town just a few miles away, and he went into, right there on Main Street, a little antique and novelty shop that had some items in the window. And in that little novelty store, he couldn't believe it, there was his boat. Apparently, it had gone down the stream maybe a few miles, and someone had kind of taken it out of the water, and they had taken it to this novelty store to be sold. So little boy ran up to the store manager and said, Mr., Mr., that's my boat. And the manager kind of smiled at him and said, no, son, that, that boat belongs to the store, but it's for sale. And this crestfallen little boy began to labor for months to earn the money to buy it back. And finally, after some months, he took his hard-earned dollars, put them down on the counter in the store and said, sir, mister, that's my boat and I want to buy it back. And he bought back his boat. And as the story goes, he, he walked out of the store that day, cradling that little boat in his hands. And he said, little boat, little boat, you're twice mine. Once did I make you, and once did I buy you back. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ today, the same could be said of you. Once did he make you. And once did he buy you back? You see, the word of Scripture is that while God created us in his own, in his own image, we went our own way, kind of hijacked our own lives, and we went into what Scripture calls the slave market of sin. It says we literally become slaves to sin. But Jesus Christ comes and says, they're mine, they're mine but a price must be paid. And the blood of bulls and goats was not enough. It took the blood of the God of the universe. He redeemed us eternally. And he says to you today, little child, little child, you are twice mine. Once did I make you, and once did I buy you back. And he did it with his own precious blood. So what's the gist of today's message? That's what gets us close. And that is what gets us clean. And so I'll go back to the beginning. The acid test of any religion is can it get you close? Can it get you clean? Jesus Christ can do both. You can't get any closer than Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's close. And you can't get any cleaner than he is faithful and just and will forgive us all our sins and purify us from all righteousness. Wow, that is clean. Jesus passes the test. And that's another reason why he's better than all the rest. Father, we rejoice today and we celebrate the fact that we are not only close, we are clean, not of our own effort, not of our own doing, but through the incredible sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf. We are twice yours. Once you made us and once did you buy us back through your sacrifice on the cross. So I pray today, Lord, for all of those who may be searching, and yet your spirit is drawing as they're searching. They're seeking, and you're drawing. They're seeking, and you're drawing them to yourself. Would you make crystal clear today to every soul, would you make so clear to them that you love them, and you want them in your family? You want them to know what it means to walk intimately with you, close and clean. And Father, I pray today that you would do that for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen.